I'm Morag and I'm employed by Southwest Water on behalf of 22 organisations and numerous individuals to deliver the Southwest Peatland Partnership. I really want to showcase the amazing work that has been delivered over the last two decades across the three moors. I hope this film gives you a good flavour of this. Enjoy!
I'm David Smith, the Natural Resources Manager in South West Water. And while these credits roll, I just want to talk to you about the South West Peatland Partnership, because it is a unique partnership um, that has evolved in the South West, with South West Water uh, being the lead party for many years, amongst some of the good uh, partnership members. And, and it's a long story, if you like. So while we go through all the people who have been involved in this long story, I'd, I'll just talk you through the many different phases and, and why we ended up with South West Water driving forward this, this work and, and the, the skill and practitioners um, embedded in the team in South West Water, which I think is unique in the UK restoration projects. So actually the very first partnership work in, South West, in the South West on Exmoor Peatland Restoration began in 1998, which seems a long time ago now. Um, a very small, less than a hectare restoration was done uh, with the Environment Agency, Exmoor National Park Authority, the lead partner, and Natural England involved. And it, it wasn't until 2006 that South West Water came along with some re reservoir mitigation funding and, and put about £400,000 into Peatland Restoration on Exmoor which paid my wages and achieved quite a lot of restoration. I think about 400 hectares of peatland restoration, if I remember, in four years. Um, and, but after that, the partnership changed really, and South West Water uh, were at that point very heavily involved in developing catchment management programmes across all their drinking water catchments. And they saw peatland restoration as being a key part of that catchment management work. Uh, and that's, if you like, following on from uh, the, the work done on SCAMP up to 2010, so we, we had eyes on that area already in the work that had been done there, uh, and but also coinciding with a lot of, of, of working with farmers in the lowlands uh, or, or certainly off the hills and the rivers like the X and the Dart in the South West, which are our main drinking water supply rivers. So it really made sense for South West Water to take uh, a lead in the partnership, uh, and from 2000 and 10 onwards we uh, funded the partnership through and also so that was work on Exmoor and on Dartmoor delivered by DMPA uh, the, Dartmoor, the first Dartmoor Myers project so we, we kept that work going really through to 2015 with, with that effort and then we entered a new phase that was uh, whereby Status Water was really the only delivery partner from 2015 onwards and um, with that larger partnership around it so all the time we were gathering partners so what was the Dartmoor Myers project evolved into uh, the Peatland partnership on Dartmoor uh, and we began to uh, source money from DEFRA and other places which enabled us really to start to think seriously about making it a, a South West Peatland partnership rather than a, an Exmoor Myers partnership or a Dartmoor Myers partnership. So we, we really used the ability of South West Water to take that large amounts of DEFRA funding that Norex team has acquired uh, up to two million pounds and, and more now from, from DEFRA and uh, bankroll that money, get the work done and then uh, claim back that money from, from DEFRA once the work is done that other, other smaller financial bodies couldn't, couldn't manage to achieve. So in effect, South West Water it, it has been leading that partnership and it's not really a, a a body in its own right. It's, it's a collection of very willing and, and committed individual uh, organisations rather than a formal partnership as such. Um, and so no legal standing within that. It, it's been South West Water who's been the, the force in the background. But we've had great help from others uh, and DMPA within that last five years, for example, have, have employed project officers, Exmoor National Park have employed project officers. So we managed to develop this fantastic system of people from different organisations, uh, different managers within those organisations working together for one common outcome. It, it's a great system, but it does challenge the capacity going forwards in how we keep that going and whether we need to look at, it is interesting to hear, uh, talking about working with Pete just earlier on, how we need to be well finely tuned for the future as, of, as in terms of our financial institutions. So whether we have the right body for that at this top point in time is an interesting thought. So going forward, what we need to do really is be able to expand the, the, the amount of staff in our team, the amount of work we can do. We're a small team. You saw in the credits there, you know, Morag has basically four, four staff members uh, delivering the work that she's been doing for the last 10 years. 
across the different wars. So lots to look forward to in the future, but a real challenge for us in terms of how we build capacity to deliver that work. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I realise I've got my IUCN glass here. That was uh, by chance rather than by planning. It's a little early in the afternoon and it's water, not gin. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, David, and thank you very much for that, that summary and commentary at the end of the video. Um, and thank you to Moreg as well. There's certainly lots of love in the chat for the uh, the video and what you've shown, and also the upbeat music, I think, was massively appreciated by lots of the audience. So thank you for giving us a change of change of pace and a change of tone for the afternoon. Um, there's quite a few questions that have popped in, so I'll just go with the, the one that's risen to the top first. With the extensive cultural use of the landscape, how do you consider cultural preservation and historic artefacts when you're restoring some of these areas? Uh, yeah, so we've been very fortunate in our project uh, in that since 2010, uh, we've had an archaeologist employed uh, as part of the team. So any sort of uh, site that we're looking to do restoration on, uh, as part of the process, the same process which we would do for sort of uh, ecological surveys. Uh, Martin, our project officer, um, does the same process for the historic environment. So he does a, his, um, a, an assessment and uses all the tools available to him, whether that's desk-based information around the historic environment records, commissions, surveys where required. Uh, and we also do um, case study work as, uh, as well. So it's a big part of our uh, work program, uh, and yeah, it's incorporated right from the right from the beginning, and it works really well because it enables our team to discuss things right at the beginning, to uh, think about mitigation work or come up with solutions to how we might want to do the restoration uh, uh, and not damage uh, any archaeology. It does present us with some challenges uh, and those are things that we're having to work around uh, and think through. Uh, and if we take, for example, on Dartmoor, uh, where there's a uh, landscape scale sort of tin streaming uh, across uh, the moorland, uh, the National Park there are looking to sort of uh, come up with a sort of ranking system of the archaeology, really, of the tin streaming so that we can because there are occasions where we do have to work on in or around some of the archaeology uh, and I think particularly in this current uh, in, you know climate emergency there are some hard decisions for us to make as a society and uh, you know how how we can take that forward really um, so yeah but it's a yeah it's integral to our team teams working and we consider it right from the beginning. Excellent David I don't know if you've got anything else to add to that. No, that's, that's great. Thanks. Perfect answer, Maura. Good stuff. Well, I've got a related question that's come in as well about how the paleoecological um, sort of environment is considered as part of the restoration as well. Do you have any um, perhaps academics that you're working with to look at the paleoecology of some of these historic sites? Yeah, so we've been uh, working with uh, the University of Plymouth uh, um, for a really long time, to be honest, um, and uh, Exmoor National Park as well commissioned uh, un the University of Plymouth uh, sort of yeah from 2006 onwards really they've been taking cores around Exmoor and Dartmoor uh, and Bodmin Moor so and we've got that paleo uh, evidence and it's really I, I can only encourage other peatland projects you know to do that because it is just fascinating in terms of what it reveals about um our landscapes and, and how we perceive them to be. Uh, and it's been really informative in helping us decide uh, some of the visioning that we're doing for those landscapes. Yeah, uh, and I'd add to that, you, you get a deep understanding of the landscape. And the, the peat on Exmoor is, is young. It's only three to 5,000 years old. It, it wasn't glaciated in the last ice age. Um, so it's, it's had come from a different place that the north of England has in terms of peatland generation. And as soon as you get off the blanket bog tops, wherever you stick a peatland core in, you encountered lots of wood in those peaty layers. So it, it certainly was a very heavily forested landscape in the past as well. And, and that forest landscape contributing to that peat accumulation. Excellent, thank you. And that's a very nice link into another question, which is looking at the, you mentioned um, timber source for some of your, your sort of woody dams and things that you're putting in and also your, um, your willow. 
So um, are any of your timber sources or willow grown on peat soils as part of a sort of sustainable wetland agriculture approach? And is that something you could consider? And is it an appropriate thing to consider in the sort of the maybe upland Dartmoor Exmoor landscape? Yeah, uh, if I um, start with the willow. So, I mean, w when we started using this, a lot of the willow was being um, taken off uh, nature reserves. Uh, so it's a really nice sort of uh, working relationship in that a lot of the willow was being cleared for uh, various fritillary butterflies like the marsh fritillary. Uh, and so rather than it being sort of chipped or burnt or whatever, we were taking it and it's been used again. So um, and we definitely would like to get to the point where, uh, particularly when we're thinking about a holistic landscape and whole scale nature recovery, that actually, yes, we've got these little bits of woodland, wet woodland that we can come back to and coppice and use mm -hmm. as and where we need, need them to be, to be used in terms of any restoration project. Um, yeah, and in terms of the woodland, in terms of uh, wood for our, our timber planks, I think particularly in the Southwest, it's a really big debate for us because we've got lots of lots of shallow peat, uh, sort of below uh, 40 centimeters. Uh, and um, yeah, what do we do with these landscapes that are being, uh, are proving very, very difficult to restore the hydrology because the peat is um, so decomposed. Uh, and I think that's sort of something that we're grappling with at the moment. And, thinking about in terms of what what do we do with them and could we potentially grow timber there uh you know in a sustainable way uh because we, will we ever get them back to functioning peatland so a big question for us so yeah watch yeah. this space i'd say emma i'll add a couple of things to that when we first started using uh, timber in in peat dams I wanted something really that would give the, because there's quite high flow of some of these uh, valley mice sites. I wanted to give something that would give structure in the dams. Um, but but Exmoor National Park, when they did their initial work, they built, you know, classic expensive dams out of the, the Beaton Restoration Handbook that were really expensive to build and made of, of, of walnut or some really hard to get wood. So I sourced Western Red Timber, which was grown on, on the woodlands at hill above Minehead, because it was local. And that was a resilient wood. And then we worked out a way of burying it in the peat dam so that that became a sustainable, long lasting uh, peat block in its own right and didn't need further maintenance. And we did try plastic and all, this, all sorts of other things as well and settled on this as being the best suitable for these peatlands that we had in the southwest in terms of their flow and slope and other things. But we, we, we don't use wood in the dams all the time. I don't know, it's about. 90% peat blocks, probably more eggs, something like that. Yeah. But more eggs ca carried on that, trying to source it locally. So we're now working with the, the Woodland Trust in the South Dartmoor Forest to supply the timber that you saw there on the video, for example. Yeah, so that's a, it's a really nice working sort of partnership on, on Dartmoor uh, where, you know, they're restoring an ancient woodland. Uh, they fell the timber and they, um, they saw all the timber to the requirements that we need uh, there on site and then it just you know is literally driving it up the moor uh, to where we need it so yeah it's a really really great partnership that's good and then, then the other thing that, that i've noticed driving around exmoor is that the roadside verges which we have some quite broad ones across the moorland where, where they don't get grazed they develop willow scrub so it is very much an element of the landscape that wants to be on those shallow peatlands um, so it's back to Morag's point. And, and actually, we've got quite a lot of willow seedlings coming up in some of our wetter restoration areas where grazing's not been able to get to in some of these valley and hill slope mires. So again, it's, it seems to be a component of the vegetation that, that, you know, there should be more of it in the landscape than there currently is. Excellent. Well, on a related, um, related topic, because you touched on uh, some of the gully blocking methods that you do use there and some of the materials, we've got a question in to say, what gully blocking methods do you use specifically on shallow peat and how have you had to adapt to those? Yeah, so on, on the shallow peat, uh, it's been mainly uh, sort of timber that we've used uh, and we uh, yeah, used t building a timber dam basically, and then we just cover it over, uh, cover the wood 
over completely with the surrounding spoil or peat that, uh, that we can take from the sides. That's mainly what we've done. When it's got into one of those pictures there, that sizable leach system that we were looking at, then we've used stone to do that. And uh, we just happened to have a pile of stone on the site which we could use. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, mainly timber for, for the sort of shallow peat areas. Yeah, and with the nature of um, and sort of age of peat you've got, do you have any issues with peat pipes on some of your more steeply sloping sites? So, so less so on on Exmoor. They are there, uh, but less so on Exmoor, Dartmoor. We're coming across them all the time, uh, and it's been really, really interesting. You know, even when we've been doing some reprofiling work. Um, to try and sort of find the source of the peat, you know, peat pipe. Uh, and even though we dig back a few meters, we can see it's still going on and on and on. Uh, and when we, in terms of the reprofiling work, we do have to stop at, at times. Uh, and then we, we are looking to do some sort of work to try and just find it further back into the landscape and try and dig down a little bit and turn the peat over and just then pull it, push it back, push it down again to try and plug that hole but for, yeah it's um yeah it's a really difficult one for us to to tackle because we are learning more and more at the time uh, all the time that there's a lot of peat piping going on yeah I, so i th i think it's it's in the past it's been a something that's happened in relationship with burning in my experience on Exmoor, where i used to see it quite a lot but uh, the, the peats on dartmoor are older so they have that difference really that they're they're 9,000 years old, some of them, so you've got good accumulation, some of the North of England. But on those shallow peaks and Exmoor, I think the, the burn, sustained burning of millennia year on year, uh, effectively dried out the peat surface and those cracks develop and the water goes down those cracks and starts running along the base of the peat rather than running along the top of the peat. And that continually, though, you get a, a system of swallow holes working back, going upslope all the time as that. Uh, effect then dries the peat out around it and it keeps migrating backwards and backwards. So I did did do some work trying to block up those swallow holes, but it's very difficult, as Morag says, to, to make a real impact on them. It's interested to hear of the future and that. Yeah, I think a number of other partnerships, certainly Yorkshire and more to the future, have done a lot on peat pipes, so it might be worth exchanging views on those. Are they something that you kind of keep a record of and we'll go back and monitor to see how successful your attempts have been? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean, just to say, so every single uh, sort of dam block that re bit of reprofiling work that we do across the moors is GPS logged. Uh, so yeah, we've and we've got a record of where those swallow holes are, where we've done work on. Um, just as a sort of a little interesting stat for, for you, so we know across the three moors we've put in over twenty six thousand uh, dams. Uh, and we've blocked over 153 miles uh, wow. of ditches. So just to give you sort of a scale of uh, yeah, the works. Quite impressive, quite impressive. And yeah, coming on to the scale of the works, David, you mentioned um, and towards the end of the video, it was highlighted the scale of the investments that's gone in from Southwest Water and other partners as well. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, multi-million pounds. Have, have you managed to get a sense of whether you're starting to claw back any benefits in terms yeah. of... <laughs> I guess this is the big question, isn't it, obviously, with this investment coming from a water company? Yeah, it's it's a long-term thing, Emma, in terms of all catchment management solutions. Sure. You, you don't, even in the lowlands, you don't see that immediate change. But, but in terms of the issues presented from the moorlands, dissolved organic carbon and particular matter, the treatment works, uh, it, it, it doesn't really, in that sense, if you look at the cost per hectare peatland restoration to us as a water company and the returns from it, it, it doesn't really stack up. So if we, if we were saying how much is it worth to us per hectare, it's probably not very much per hectare. And we, we're certainly paying more than not very much per hectare in terms of the total investment. And, and it's not just the, the restoration monitoring, the monitoring has also been very expensive. And there's been, I see in the early presentations, and chat about a consistent monitoring program. We've sp probably spent, I'm trying to think, half a million pounds on monitoring, and perhaps even more in terms of the investment in the current program. Again, we have a, a significant uh, monitoring bill across the entire catchment management program, which is called upstream thinking. So you see that logo upstream thinking, that's what the catchment management program is called for Southwest Water. Uh, and going forward, that's a million pound uh, monitoring program across that five-year investment 
So that that's, it shows our level of commitment to monitoring. And we've been looking at greenhouse gas, uh, water tables, flow, color, uh, water quality, uh, vegetation, impact of, of the activity on the farming economy uh, and farmability of the landscape. So a whole suite of monitoring really, I think, has captured everything. Well, did I miss it? The paleo as well, of course, that you've talked yeah, about. Historic yeah, environment, yeah. Uh, historic environment. Uh, and yeah, uh, that historic environment monitoring is actually an additional cost that I've not told you about already. So it's, it has been an expensive project to be involved in. So why, why do we do it, I guess, is the question. Um, we do it not just for those water quality benefits. We also do it um, because as a, a water company, we uh, are set things by the Environment Agency in terms of the National Environment Programme. The, the Environment Agency sets that out. So, so they ask us to do some things. Uh, and that's in line with us being a, a responsible company in terms of our operating area and the catchments we operate in. We also, as a company, have natural capital targets. Uh, so natural capital outcomes and biodiversity outcomes are very much part of our um, set of outcome delivery incentives that we report to the water regulator off or on. And actually, we, we have a penalty reward system behind that. So if, if we don't achieve what we said we would achieve, we get, uh, we get penalties in terms of our performance delivered and they're multi-million pound penalties. So having set this program up, there's now a real incentive for us to, to do well uh, and to deliver on it across across the peatland restoration, which, which is part of the catchment management program. And, and then lastly, of course, like, like everybody else, uh, Water UK, which is our uh, uh, water company representative uh, or company organisation, has set uh, carbon neutral targets in line with UK government's carbon neutral targets. So all the major water companies, of which there are uh, 11 major water companies in England and Wales, uh, are now thinking about how they deliver against those carbon uh, neutral targets going forward and, and how and peat and restoration and tree planting are both parts of that as well for us. Excellent. Well, it's good to hear it's a, it's a very holistic approach and there's a lot of joint up action going on across mm -hmm. the different water boards across the UK, certainly. There's another very big and very complex question that might split the room that's come in as well. Given global warming, do blanket bogs have a future in the southwest of England? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great one. Uh, the, the simple answer is yes, and there's a, there's a longer reason right behind that. <laughs> So, so if, if you're from the East Anglia, or from the English offense like me, you, you understand these things because there are there's not very much rainfall. You know, the River Glen used to dry up every summer, um, but but there are blanket bogs, so no, uh, lowland bogs in that landscape as well. So the reason for that is that if you can maintain those uh, communities and habitats in those peatlands and main, maintain those peatlands as functional habitats, that they should be have a built-in resilience to that climate change. Additionally to that, when you look at the modelling that's been done in terms of the climate envelope, it, it, it does show that that climate envelope shrinks, so we need that resilience in there. But there, there is, in my mind, some question about the, the, the scope of that modelling, because it, it doesn't take into account where people formerly existed. And we know from, from the survey work that, that was highlighted yesterday on Dartmoor, for example, by uh, Naomi and David, that there's 40% of that peatland on Dartmoor is under grass uh, and not really evident as peatland. So we know that peat was much more extensive in these landscapes than, than in terms of peatland communities. The peat's still there, but the community's gone. Um, so it's up to us to hang on to those communities and look after them as best we can where they remain. Uh, and they should remain in place, even though the climate changes around them. That's it. I would just add to that as well. I suppose from the paleo evidence, peatlands have shown huge resilience and persistence in a lot of these landscapes as well for you know for thousands of years. And, so. and they've changed within that, and we know that from the from the cause we've done as well that, that there has been change within those communities. Excellent. Well, thank you. Well, I'll take um, facilitators' prerogative because we've kind of reached the end of the submitted questions, but there was a couple of other issues I want to touch on. Um, Common land, I guess, is a bit of a, an issue and a challenge perhaps um, for Dartmoor and Exmoor. How have you dealt with the issues of sort of common land ownership 
and, and what sort of specialised communications tools have you had to use to try and bring people on board with the landscape scale restoration that you're doing? Do you want to start, David, or should I? Or should no, Morag, you, you're, you're much closer to the commoners than me these days. Yeah, so it, it is a, it's a very uh, complicated sort of process uh, to work through because you're, you're not just working with one landowner, you're, you're, de you're dealing with uh, sort of multiple numbers of people, uh, you know, and it can range for, on a particular common from something like five people to 200 people. Uh, and, you know, some of them are active graziers, some of them aren't active graziers. Um, so we've been working particularly uh, on Dartmoor uh, and under our Dartmoor Peatland Partnership, we have representatives uh, from the farming and commoners community. So they come to our, uh, they're part of that board. Uh, they're in that process of uh, discussion uh, uh, around what's happening on the peatlands, where they are and, and, and what we're doing and what our ambitions are. Uh, and then it's that process of continue communicating with them to understand um, what the issues are for them. You know, uh, you know, what are the challenges for them in terms of we do peat and restoration on on part of the common. You know, what's in it for them financially? Uh, you know, through agri environment schemes, or you know, who knows what 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 might be down down the road into the future, um, and. I think, you know, a lot of it is also trying to get, we're working really hard on, on Dartmoor to try and get local contractors, you know, whether those are commoners, you know, themselves or their sons, daughters, whoever it might be to be involved in that restoration work. But it's definitely around communication and just, you know, trying to, you know, yeah, understand it from both sides, really, to say, you know, this is why we're doing the work from a peat and restoration point of view. How does that impact your farming uh, uh, and what the benefits are for your farming as well? Do you know, there's some areas, that, you know, we're both uh, in agreement, you know, our uh, low value agricultural land, you know, it's the big gullies, they can't, you know, the stock can't graze in there anyway. Uh, and, you know, by doing some of the work, you know, we, the way we create some of the dams, we allow access routes across for their quad bikes and their stock. So it's all, you know, all those things. It's just, yeah, I would say the biggest thing is around communication, really. Uh, you know, and we are on Dartmoor, there's uh, the National Park is working with other organisations to set up uh, programmes like the Common Cause, just to provide a, uh, a sort of uh, a common vision for those particular commons and the commoners bring that together and then as partners we all help to deliver that work really. Okay. And have you found with some of your sites that peer pressure has a bit of a role to play in this so that once someone does something on sort of one patch of land the neighbouring sort of common areas will maybe think oh well maybe this is a sensible approach or it's you know not quite as wet as I feared it might be or have you found that that's sort of part of your your toolkit if you like for getting people on board? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, when you can sort of uh, showcase the work that you're doing and what it actually means on the ground and people can see that and visualise it, uh, then that, that really helps. And then, you know, other people, other commoners can come and see that uh, and, um, yeah, and you get that greater understanding and, and it brings people on, on board, uh, really. I mean, I think, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing at the moment is the change in agri-environment schemes in terms of commons. Uh, you know, we're stuck in this slight limbo land of uh, transition between, you know, countryside stewardship, high level stewardship uh, and whatever elms may be, uh, you know, and uh, for a lot of uh, commoners, farmers, uh, some of that is, you know, waiting to see. So there's a reluctance to do any work because they're waiting to see that, you know, if Elms is going to be this, you know, great financial provider uh, and, you know, none of us know what that really is going to be. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting time for us uh, in terms of delivery at the moment because of the situation we find ourselves in. I think that's a common theme across the four countries at the moment is that uncertainty with the agricultural payments and what the systems are actually going to look like and deliver. 
um, is yeah, yeah. proving to be a, a barrier for landowners yeah, in lots of circumstances. Yeah. But for, for the commons, of course, it's it's not just the common um, commoners to take into account. You know that that land just the thought itself is a commons owner, uh, and there's quite a big commons owner in the Duchy of Cornwall who owns the largest commons in the north of Dartmoor, for example. So those owners are part of the story as well. It's, it's not just about the commons, it's making sure we bring those along too. It, coming out of that, there's a really interesting question about who owns the carbon. Is it, is it Southwest Water as a developer? Is it DEFRA because they funded it? Is it is it the is it the the common owner who who owns the standing carbon on the on the land? Perhaps we're talking, of course, about who owns the mitigation, the carbon reductions that you've managed to achieve through peatland restoration. Yeah, uh, it's a, is, it, or is, it, is it a commoner as well? So, uh, or is it an environment agency who've also given us money to do peatland restoration too? So it, it gets very really interesting actually to think about those things and how you then turn that money. If you can sell that peatland mitigation uh, carbon emission saved uh, to a buyer, uh, you know how, who 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 gets that money and what's it used for? Is it for more restoration? Is it to provide a revenue for the for the for the commoners who have been on that land through an investment vehicle? Um, and if the if the commoners can't graze on that land anymore, what what you know what is their new rights and, and how how do we build those into into the common law. So there's all sorts of questions come out of that. Yeah, it's a complex setup, isn't it? I suppose there's a couple of things on that. So um, specifically with the Peatland Code, obviously being the vehicle for carbon sort of credits and carbon rights, if you like, at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I suppose at the moment it is the private investor that gets the whole chunk of the, the carbon credits, and that's the to the investor's benefit. So even if government have put in up to 85% of the capital funding, that investor is still potentially walking away with 100% of the, the credits. Um, so that makes it a pretty good deal for them at the moment. I suppose when you think about these landscapes where you've got a lot more players involved, and particularly with common land, where you know you think about actually lots of people have the right to that change and that that marketing of that asset potentially. Um, you know where do they fit in? And I suppose the opportunity for them is through um, the increased health of the peatland and the potential payments through the new agri environment systems for payments for healthy peatlands. So that private investment has maybe come in to support that initial sort of kickstart and change to the state of the peatland, which then unlocks and enables these other payments to come from hopefully the way future and agri environment systems are going to be going to be built and constructed in the future. And that's certainly the, the indications for England anyway. So there is an incentive, I suppose, for, for getting these peatlands fixed and on a um, pathway back to health now for other land users to be able to benefit in the future from new schemes. So yeah, interesting new landscape. We've just got a couple of minutes left. So I suppose there's a, a final comment from one question that's come in about any monitoring reports that's available from any of your work. Do you have stuff on your website that you can share? Will you be at the exhibition space later? Or are there any documents you can post on the notice board to the audience? Great question, love yeah. it. More I'd go for it. Uh, yeah, so obviously the University uh, of Exeter um, have uh, just released their uh, last 10 years uh, of monitoring uh, and that should be it was uh, become available on their website and our website uh, in the next uh, uh, well imminently should we say uh, so that will uh, be available uh, yeah and we do have a document library on our sort of website which um, has all our reports and information but I'm very happy if, if there's anything in particular someone wants to get in touch about then just please email me or give me a bell Okay, great. Well, perhaps I could just suggest that maybe you put the link to the document library on the notice board so that the delegates can, can pop there and um, easily find it. And if you've got any new publications coming out, then obviously let IUCN know and we can push it out through the next newsletter and make sure everyone gets to see it. You know, so that's great. So we've come to the end of our questions and we're almost at the end of our slot anyway. So I'd just like to thank you both for your, your time and your excellent and comprehensive answers in the discussion this afternoon. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. <laughs> Thank Great you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.